just start uh, recording it. Thank you all. Welcome to the CPD meeting of the Department of Family Medicine. Um, we have uh, interns uh, from Alex who are going to share morbidity and mortality data and review it. So welcome. Thank you all. And uh, thank you to Dr. Singh and, um, and colleague um, for presenting. Go ahead, uh, Sanesha. Sure, thank you so much. Good morning, colleagues. Welcome to the Alexandra Community Health Center Mobility and Mortality Meeting. Our slideshow was a group effort by the September intern group at Alex, comprised of myself, Sainashia Singh, Melanie Bambia, Sabata Numalo, Joshua Smith, and Lerato Makobe. Firstly, taking a look at statistical data, here is a table summarizing the main trauma incidents that presented to casualty from June to August. So we see that the grand total of patients seen over the three months was 1,979, of which August made up 56%, followed by 35% in June and 29% in July. It's interesting to see that even with lockdown restrictions, the number of patients who presented in June is similar to that of August, with a similar comparison in the number of general assaults, burns, MVAs, PVAs, stabs, gunshots, public violence accidents, and hijackings. We can see that general assaults tops the list here, making up 50% of the total patients seen, followed by burns at 15%, PVAs at 10%, MVAs at 7%, stab wounds at 6%, ICAs at 6%, gunshot wounds at 2%, and the remainder of the categories contributing 1% or less to the conditions that were seen in casualty. If we take a gender-based approach to comparing the data, we see that of the total number of patients who presented from June to August, 63% were male and 37% were female with the exception of ICAs that can only be attributed to females. In the other categories, we see that a majority of the trauma conditions were from the male population. The top five from general assaults to stab wounds being significantly higher in the male population. So you should, you in the do you next, mind? Do you mind just using, uh, not using abbreviations, just for people who might not understand it? Oh, sure. Sorry. Going Good. forward, I will not use the abbreviations. No problem. Thanks. So over the next few slides, uh, we are just having a look at a graphical representation of the statistics that were already mentioned in the first two tables. So in this slide, we can just appreciate a visual representation of the total number of injuries and illnesses seen according to category over the three months. And here, uh, we were, we've broken down each incident category into the respective months, where, as we've already discussed, one can see that in the general assault category, June and August numbers were far higher, whereas for the remainder of the categories, the number of patients who presented per month was similar. And um, that's even taking into consideration that over the first few months, lockdown restrictions were higher. So um, the category, the, even with lockdown restrictions, we can see that the incidents that presented to casualty were still quite similar. Next, we are going to discuss the dead on arrival section. Please note that names have been omitted or altered in the section for confidential purposes. Also, every bit of information which was recorded in the notes has been included. In some files, however, minimal information was recorded. 
thus we do not have all the information in these cases but we will present what we did find so starting at the beginning of august we have our first uh, dead on arrival patient for august mrs matabata a 48 year old female who was brought in by her sister and husband on history, the patient was known to be an asthmatic, had shortness of breath since early in the morning. The family said that she left home while having an asthma attack and her inhaler was finished. She intended to buy an inhaler at clicks on her way to work. On examination, her vitals were undetectable. There was no respiratory effort. Her tongue was cyanosed. Her pupils were fixed and dilated, and she was thus certified as a death on arrival. Next, we have baby Dembe, a 10-month-old male brought by his mother. On history, his immunizations were up to date. He was known to have breathing problems since birth. He was on examination, unresponsive, Vitals were undetectable. There was no breathing response, no pulse. Pupils were fixed and dilated, and he was certified as a DO, a death on arrival. Next, Mr. Kwayede, a 54 year old gentleman, was brought by the emergency medical services on a stretcher accompanied by his colleague. On history, he was reported to have stopped breathing two hours before arriving with loss of consciousness. On examination, no vitals were recordable. Both his upper and lower limbs were bluish in color. There was no breathing response, no pulse. Pupils were fixed and dilated, and the patient was certified as a death on arrival. We then have Mr. Ntombela, a 30-year-old male who was brought on a stretcher by emergency medical services. With regards to this patient, the history is relatively unknown and no details of the history were recorded in the notes. On examination, he was unresponsive, vitals were not recordable, his pupils were fixed and dilated, and he was certified as a death on arrival. Next, Mrs. Mbokane, a 50-year-old female, was brought by her husband. On history, she was known to be an asthmatic with recent bronchitis, found at home, not moving or breathing. On examination, the patient was unresponsive, with no pulse, no pupils here on arrival. Then we have Ms. Mbata, an eight-year-old female brought by her father. On history, the father described that the patient had fallen off a bicycle in front of the house and never woke up. On examination, her body was cold and bluish in color. The patient was not responsive. There was no breathing response, no pulse pupils were fixed and dilated and the patient was certified as a death on arrival. Then we have Mr. Mandluena, a 72 year old male brought by his daughter. On history, he was a known hypertensive. His daughter reported that he had shaking movements at home followed by loss of consciousness. On examination, there was no breathing response, no vitals recorded, no pulses present, pupils were fixed and dilated, and the patient was certified as a death on arrival. Mr. Yaku, a 56-year-old male, was brought on a stretcher accompanied by family members on history the family reported that the patient had a painful left foot ulcer and collapsed at home. On examination, there were no vitals recordable. The patient was unresponsive. 
There was no pulse, no respiratory effort. The pupils were fixed and dilated and the patient was certified as a debt on arrival. Next, we have Mr. Rahuba, a 47 year old male was brought by his wife. The only history that we know is that the patient had a retroviral disease. On examination, his vitals were undetectable. There was no pulse. There was no breathing response. Pupils were fixed and dilated and the patient was certified as a death on arrival. Next, Mr. Sibanda, a 12 year old male on history was described as being involved in a pedestrian vehicle accident. On examination, it was found that the patient had blood in his mouth. He was unresponsive. There was no pulse, no respiratory efforts. The pupils were fixed and dilated and the patient was certified as a death on arrival. Next, Mr. Schlatzweil, a 25 year old male was brought by his family with a history of being stabbed in the chest. On examination, the patient was not responsive with no breathing response, pulses, and pupils were fixed and dilated. He was certified as a death on arrival. And lastly, for uh, August, we have Mr. Doma, a 34 year old male who was brought by his relatives. On history, they described that the patient had been stabbed multiple times. On examination, the patient was not responsive, no pulses were present, and the pupils were fixed and dilated. Subsequently, he was certified as a death on arrival. In my ne the next section, my colleague Joshua Smith will go over our cases. Okay, so this is case number one. Um, 54 year old male presented to Alex uh, casualty, no known comorbidities. This was at 10 o'clock in the morning. His main complaint was he had the shortness of breath for two day duration. So on examination of the patient, he had sets of 96% on room air, a respiratory rate of 20, blood pressure of 120 over 88 and a pulse of 86. Um, he was using accessory muscles to breathe and on auscultation of the chest, he had decreased air entry and crackles on the left. Um, he had bilateral pitting edema, um, so the treatment he was given, he was given a Moxil and Keftriaxo, and Edenvale was called and a message was left. So just try to keep that in mind. Um, what this exactly means, we'll, we'll try to come to a better understanding of this. Okay, on the next slide. Um, so that was at 10 o'clock. At 2.30, two, at two um, there's no notes between 10 o'clock and 2.30. SATs dropped to 76% on uh, polymask on O2. Um, uh, definitive uh, uh, arrangements was made to, with Edenvale for transfer. Uh, um, at 3.30, um, we're still waiting for the EMS. Um, EMS was contacted to say the patient was deteriorating. At 4.10, SATs dropped to 66 on the poly mask. Patient was intubated. At 4.20, um, patient uh, entered into cardiac arrest. CPR was initiated. Six cycles of CPR was done. Um, at 4.30, uh, patient was declared um, to have died, uh, dead. So before we go to the next slide, if anybody um, on the presentation would like to know if any points that they would raise about uh, the history and the examination, this is all the notes that were available about this patient's case. So that's all we have to go on. I don't know if anybody who's on the meeting would like to go and offer any information or any advice or any criticism on this case before we move on to the learning points. Perhaps I can just ask the question, Prof Musa here. Um, you say that there's no um, notes between 10, 10 o'clock and 14.30. That's correct. There's no, there's no, there's no notes between 10 and, and 2.30. Okay, and all these notes are what was put out in the document, in the file. There's no additional yes, notes, nursing correct. notes or otherwise. Yeah, this, this is what was in the file. Okay. Well, it's very difficult for you to answer any questions, but um, I think uh, let proceed and let's see how we how we go through this. Dr. So Manda, me, are you able to was... able to comment, or would you like to ask any questions? I'm stepping in, but uh, if you want to come in, 
So you can unmute yourself. Could proceed to Joshua. So for me, I think the first the first question was um, in the notes. It's very clearly uh, stated there that um, Edenvale was was contacted and a message was left. I can only um, offer a suggestion that the Edenvale was called and they couldn't get hold of an accepting doctor. Maybe the doctor was available, unavailable with a different patient or had a different emergency. So it ha does happen that you would say, okay, this is my name, this is my number, please call me back so we can arrange transfer. Mm. So that, that is my guess what's happened. And maybe that is one of the reasons for the delay between the diagnosing of the patient and the doctor who treated the patient, seeing that um, the patient should be, recognizing that this was a patient who should have been transferred. Um, so that's the only the only guess I can give is that Edenville was called. Unfortunately, there was some sort of miscommunication or drop of the ball between um, calling Edenville and arranging a definitive transport. So that was the first learning point was when you when you when you've made a plan, try and make sure that you follow it through and that the definitive arrangements are made so that this patient can get transferred because there was a there's a four and a half hour gap between that ten o'clock arrival mm. and this desaturation of two thirty and perhaps. If this patient was already at a facility like Edenville, an outcome might have been different. Of course. The, the next learning, um, for me, the next learning outcome was perhaps a more more of a definitive plan on on the airway of the patient between the the, the two thirty and the four thirty. There's a two hour gap where perhaps a more definitive plan of intubation or further treatment could be given. It is difficult at Alex. There's no ventilator, so to intubate a patient is, is quite a big decision. Um, once you've decided to intubate the patient, you're going to have to stare and bag. And we know, which brings me back to the, the second point of this list, is once you've called for that ambulance, you don't know what time that ambulance is coming. So once you've decided to intubate a patient, um, you, it's very intensive to sit and bag that patient for who knows how long. But obviously sitting here and saying early intubation, it's very easy to sit here and ask that question. But um, knowing what was exactly going on, how quickly or how slowly, the patient deteriorated and exactly what the circumstances were. But that second point on the list, they're talking about the, the delay of the ambulance. It's, it is something that we encounter pretty much every single day and understand that the system is probably overloaded and there are very severe P1 cases everywhere. But in this case, I think it was, it's, it could have been, could have a different outcome had perhaps in a different day with you know, uh, easier access to Edenvale an ambulance arriving earlier but it's as i say it's quite easy to sit here and discuss it like this when when mm. you're sitting there in the casualty and these patients present it's quite hard to to make sure everything runs smoothly true i think carry on uh, uh, joshua yes richard go ahead you i think richard you had your hand up or you're speaking go ahead no it's jimmy jimmy, jimmy, jimmy yes jimmy go Find ahead out, jimmy. Uh, Yes, I, I just wanted to find out what was done for the patient um, as, uh, on arrival because it looks like there is some missing information there. Was the patient appropriately triaged? And if so, what was done for the patient? Because Joshua, just move the back timeline one of the slides. from or, uh, when the patient reported to yeah. On on arrival, patient had ninety six percent sets and looked pretty stable. Yes. But the problem exactly. is that the it was four so, hours so before the reassess. Point is, what what happened between that time? Yes. What happened between that time and when the patient started deteriorating? What did the do the doctors do for this patient? So did they decide they said. A patient that needed attention, what was done? To, to my understanding, the patient was triaged as a, as a lower respiratory tract infection because of the decreased air entry and the crackles on the left. And with this using accessory muscles to breathe, the antibiotics were given and the plan was to transfer to Edenvale. That was the plan. What happened between 10 o'clock and 2.30, and I can't give you an exact answer to that. But it was, it was <coughs> triaged as is sick enough to be transferred to Edenvale. Um, yeah. Then the antibiotics were given and a patient was most likely waiting for the ambulance to arrive. 
Joshua, we'll we'll come back to the question. I think the you know a key problem in or key issue in in M and M's is is not to feel the need for blaming. I think that, um, but to sit back and ask what's preventable and how do we actually address situations? How do we address the learning points you brought up? Um, but I think that it's not all directed at you. I think uh, Prof will just respond, uh, and then we'll try and get comments from people in the in the meeting, and I'm going to point out uh, people to see if they can comment. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Cook, Prof Cook. And if you can pick up Thank your you, hand, Shabir. and uh, if you want to comment, please feel free to raise your hand using the um, the, uh, in the the Zoom facility. Thanks, Richard. Go ahead. Yes. Um, no, I just wanted to comment on the importance of 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 um, guidelines in these instances and the specific, in this instance, the specific clinical criteria that needed to be assessed for whether the patient need to be referred in the first instance. Um, I note that, for example, um, patient had SATs of 96, but had a use of accessory muscles and to assist breathing, but did have a respiratory rate of only 20 at the time of, of, uh, of admission or rather presentation. So what, what criteria were used to specifically feel the need, according to the guidelines, to have to contact Edenvale in the first instance? And um, secondly, that you'll find that the guidelines for, for, um, for management of a, of a patient of this nature specifically speak to a establishment of a trend. In other words, a snapshot uh, uh, assessment of the of the, the the of the numbers as you've described them needs to be accompanied by um, a a uh, follow up soon after that to establish a trend again according to the guidelines. So that would be interesting to 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 uh, as a I think that's a clear learning point in this instance is um, is the guidelines a criteria for referral B and establishing a trend C. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> Dr. Manda, would you like to comment anything? Um, I think you are at uh, uh, Alex. Um, is there a protocol for managing a patient um, that is deemed needed to be referred, referred as this one patient was considered? Dr. Manda? So, uh, Joshua and uh, Sanesha. Uh, uh, Joshua, will you be dealing with the case? I think Sanesha, you you can also comment on this. Um, you, how would you change this? You were in charge of uh, of Alex CHC, you know, the chief medical officer, the senior person in charge. How would you address this problem um, typified by this case? Any suggestions? <laughs> Uh, for me, from my point of view, I think the, the biggest issue, I think, is that gap from 10 o'clock till 2.30 sure. um, that maybe this patient was. It, it does happen that when, you know, you've come up with a plan and you say the patient's perhaps waiting for an ambulance or transfer to a different facility, then you go back to the queue and you're just trying to see all the other patients um, who are waiting to be seen who are unseen. So it could be that maybe you just need to make sure that patients who've been seen and are waiting um further management or a definitive plan aren't kind of ignored or misplaced between uh, the ambulance arriving or someone deteriorating. So maybe just some sort of a, a way to, to make sure that everyone who's, who has been seen is monitored on a regular, regular basis, whether it's by a nurse or a doctor or even just a, a set of vitals or even just a visual inspection of the patient to see how they're doing or even just to talk to them and see how they feeling or if they if anything's changed maybe every hour or two depending on how you the severity of that patient so, so it's a maybe if at 12 o'clock a protocol that just assesses patients that you say at this point in time even using the SA triad score this patient would have been considered perhaps uh, um, you know a sort of uh, orange case but uh, you still would would be able to, um, you, might, you might have a question of how, how often do you do it in the facility? So it requires a local local protocol. Um, Michelle, go ahead, you want to speak? 
Um, hi everyone, yeah, it's Michelle speaking. Um, my, my two comments were, um, uh, as you just said, I think the monitoring of patients is so important because you made quite a dramatic kind of deterioration. And often um, if you're monitoring vitals, you'll get an indication of that before. Um, so I think I think we wait, the way we monitor the patients in the county is, is quite important and not to quietly deteriorate in a corner. Um, and then the other thing was, I wasn't sure with, with the whole Eden, I know Dr. Mander didn't answer, but usually um, if a proper referral was made, there should be a transfer note and Eden Bell needs to be phoned and, and accept patients. So there would be a transfer with the doctor's name there. So. Uh, I'm not sure how that whole process unfolded, but also know it can be difficult to get hold of Eden Bell and the other stories. So I think just very a better note keeping, um, just always kind of uh, make sure that you you keep your notes very well. If, um, so because the, this kind of thing happens. So so the learning points. I mean, I think you pointed out the problems, but the way in which you improve it is to ensure that notes in the casualty are actually improved. So there needs to be a way in which protocols, education is, is imparted to the doctors working there, or even nurses, because it's not necessarily a doctor's problem, that they be monitored and that, that the process of monitoring occurs, in which you have a criteria to say, listen, any patient referred or any patient considered by the different levels of um, as the SAT scores, when I'm talking about SAT triage score scales, and then you just say, listen, this is what we will do in our facility. And if it's not there, um, then there's liability that starts coming through. So... Um, Can I make one more comment there, Prof? Yes. Sorry, I'm just looking at the notes that were taken. I'm not sure that they gave a stab at a diagnosis here. I, I was a check x-ray done. Um, it's, no. You know, okay. there could be a cardiac element here as well. We don't know. So for me, also just a clearer... Um, yeah, I think yeah. the point is that this is the record. It's a, it's a post-mortem. And the question you're asking is what would have been, what should have been done? Um, that could be, I mean, I suppose the question uh, sure. is how do you manage triage scoring or how do you manage patients in that setting? And um, with a, with a uh, protocol. Shall we, can we just comment go ahead, something? Yeah, yes. Go ahead, Yes. Um, most of the most of the CHCs uh, now have point of care testing. Perhaps um, this patient should have been done maybe a quick UNE. It could have given us an idea of uh, the severity of the problem. So I'm wondering, was that done at all? I think, I think Dr. Manda could answer was, whether that's available, but it's not here. Clearly, the, in, the, Joshua has taken all the records. So what he's not done or what was done and not done is clearly reflected in the records. Am I wrong, Joshua? You've rec put all That's the records correct. out here. So he couldn't answer about what was not done or done otherwise. So I think that what you have is what you have. We have to ask the question is, that is what was done as per record. So as uh, Dr. Toluta says, records need to be improved um, they were, and especially in terms of when you call a hospital, uh, you need to write the name of the person you talked of, what was the decision, um, and I think that's your name as well in all records. So there's a clear record keeping problem at uh, Alex, which they can look at as a quality improvement project. Then there's this question of protocols with dealing with patients. The clear gap that's here is that there was two challenges that Joshua raised. One is the time time lags between between monitoring. And in this case, this patient here, it's not very clear as to the sort of vital status. Um, it seemed rather stable, um, but because of two factors, one, he had clear signs of pneumonia and that he was considered a referral case that should be incorporated into the sort of triad scoring where patients are monitored on a more clearer basis to prevent this problem. So whether it is depending on your volumes and local challenges and your triad scoring that you use there, you basically need to look at how you prevent such a problem by setting out whether it is one hour, two hourly to then manage that case. Uh, I think the other question is to be asked and that uh, Dr. Aki raised 
is what do you do? And maybe Joshua, um, you can respond to this. How would you deal with the EMS? Clearly, there's a challenge with EMS as well. You're in charge. If I can just, yeah. If I can go just ahead. go back. So actually, I was on call last night at Hillbrow, right? And we had seven patients waiting for ambulance transport. The longest patient, the waiting time of the longest patient was over ten hours last yesterday. True. She was seen. She was seen around nine, ten o'clock in the morning. She was transported out at about nine, at nine, ten o'clock at night. There was an incomplete miscarriage. There were two pneumonias, um, multiple fractures. There was a dehydrated, uh, severe dehydrated child. Um, so just to, going on last night's experience, there's, there's two points from that. The number one is you're, you're managing a full running casualty, but at the same time, you're trying to manage six or seven, <coughs> some, of them, some of them unstable patients while still running the casualty. And then the other point is then you're waiting for the EMS. So it, it is a bit of a balancing act, but I think having gone through this case, got to just try and make sure that you can't, once you've got that plan for the patient who's lying on the bed with a drip and the ambulance form has been filled in, not to ignore them and just focus on new patients coming in. How often exactly to reassess those patients on, on the bed waiting for transport? I think that would, would have to be a, a case by case basis, depending on what their severity is. But I think just to keep in our minds that even though we've made a definitive plan, we've made a diagnosis, we've done the x-ray, we've given the analgesia, we've given the antibiotics, we still need to just go to those beds and just to reassess them, whether it's every hour or two. But we had seven patients last night all waiting for transport at the same time. So then realistically, to try monitor seven patients while still running a heelbrow casualty will definitely have its will definitely have its issues. But I think that raises a problem, Joshua. You're not functioning alone. And I think that one of the things, if you're a doctor in charge or the only doctor there, or part of the management process, which invariably next year or the year after uh, doctors would be, you need to actually say, how do I deal with it, not manage it myself? So I think that by writing out a protocol, you can actually establish that that is a nursing duty and that nurses need to be told that that patient needs monitoring and write that in the note that in fact, nurse so-and-so is going to take charge of this process. So I think that you, you know, firstly, don't think you function alone. We talked about writing in the notes, but I think the question is that you don't need to assume that, that EMS problems are just life and that's tough. You need to do something about it. And if you don't do things about it, then, you've, then, then medical legal responsibility falls to you. So you need to, as a on the ground, in all in any of these circumstances, be thinking about my medical legal responsibility. And the doctors, for example, sitting there, potentially be called to account for this death. And they be held accountable in various ways, whether the individual doctor that was sitting there and that did not check on this patient every four hours, um, but the doctors collectively through their manager to say, well, there was their protocol and that protocol needs to include other people, not make it the responsibility only of doctors. And then the last is that has any attempt been made to address the problem with EMS? Was there any documented evidence that you pointed out a continued challenge of EMS? And, I'm, and I think that, yes, you know, that lands up to be Dr. Aki or the doctor in charge. But you as a, as a doctor on the ground, you ask yourself, are Can these things please? addressed? Um, so it's important that in all of these circumstances, you look at what have you done, even though you're not responsible for everything. What have you done? to make sure that systems run. And have, if you've not done it, then, the, then you share blame. I think that's an important principle to keep in mind. When you face uh, a hearing about a death or a, a <clears throat> law, that becomes the kinds of issues that will be raised. Um, so Dr. Kalula, do you want to say something? Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, I wanted just to add to what Michelle said. Yes. Uh, I think if an, a chest X-ray was done or a ECG, it looks like this patient had a cardiac and or a renal problems, uh, which we could see through the pedal edema that he had. I suggest if a little bit of furosemide was given, it would have somehow given another outcome. That's all I wanted to say. Sure. 
So you think, based... uh, Shabir? Go ahead. Um, I, I think people, if you don't mind, just pretty put your hand uh, up. I was just wondering. And then others. Um, so, Jimmy, just a sec. I think Isidora, if you want to speak, just put your hand up. Otherwise, I'm going to mute you. Uh, go ahead, Jimmy. Yes, um, I was just wondering, given the period we are in of COVID, was this uh, ruled out in this patient? Clearly not. Correct. No, I don't think that was ruled out at all. I think that's the problem. It could very well have been the reason this patient deteriorated. So the, that actually is the first, uh, first uh, idea. Say something? Yes, go ahead, Maggie. Yes, that's what I wanted exactly to, to raise what Dr. Key just said. I'm having a problem with the history of the patient and the real examinations. For me, that saturations and respiratory rate and the blood pressure and the pulse doesn't match with the description of the history and also uh, the examination with using the accessory muscles uh, and then the, the chest with the crackles. It doesn't match that sometimes the nurses give you uh, readings which are not truthful. So be careful with that. I'm not trying to blame anybody, but uh, I've been a witness they give you some blood pressure which doesn't match with the condition of the patient. The other issue which I'm going, uh, I want to raise is the, uh, the amoxyl and ceftriaxone. This is for me unnecessary to be given. That patient won't improve from that uh, application of uh, these two antibiotics. And um, even if you read the EDL, it doesn't guide you to, to give amoxyl and ceftriaxone. Uh, maybe for, for kids, it's applicable, but according to the uh, IMCI, how to apply and in what conditions to apply the antibiotics. But for adults, please avoid to do that because you're creating resistance and you're not achieving anything with this antibiotics. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm not sure uh, that that you're saying. Sorry, Maggie, if you may respond. Uh, are you saying that an antibiotic is not warranted in this patient with decreased air entry and crackles on the left? No, I'm saying that this two antibiotics no, I understand won't two, contribute. But will to you give any antibiotic? Yeah, it it was not necessary. Maybe it, it needed to be. Uh, thinking about uh, having this patient having a COVID and then uh, additional cardiac condition or renal condition, as Dr. Kalula mentioned. So it was okay. not it, necessary, these two antibiotics given. Yeah, I think the question would be, is they this patient... The deterioration, but they didn't contribute for improving the patient. And no, no. it's just a waste of resources. Yeah, I think that in retrospect, it would be easy to say that the question is that would you have would you have done otherwise, given this presentation to the patient, where the patient, at, as per note, says decrease air entry and crackles. That question. Let's not look at the rest of the case. Would you have um, not given an antibiotic? Let's not look at the progression. I'm saying in this particular circumstance. Anyway, let's leave that point. I think it's uh, it's a question of. This particular assessment. Now, in a in a M and M, you know, the objective is not to uh, adjust sit and look at this individual patient and say, well, how would we have done differently and clinically only. It's about saying, how do we improve systems? And uh, to me, that's really the real value of an M and M. It is not just a case discussion. So perhaps we should go back to what Sanesh has raised, and I think the question is. Uh, thank you very much, Joshua. I think that this raises a problem, but when you go back to what Sanesha is, Sanesha, is it, uh, are you on the call still? Yes. I think that the key question is that out of your list of, of statistics, and I think that I would also suggest in future that you're, just like you put out your data, any intern presenting it, that the way you put out your data in terms of um, statistics, as you've just done now, the same should be done. That's, that's all, all um, you might say, after hours cases. Isn't that 
Am I wrong, um, Xenesha? Are these cases? This is actually the total casualty cases for right. 24 hours. So that's kind of so your morbidity from... in the facility, so to say, in the after hours facility. All right? Am I wrong? So that's... Uh, it's, it's casualty statistics. It's not uh, only after hours. It's total, even from the morning. All right. So it's a 24-hour, but it's a casualty statistics. And then you yes. provided the deaths, the morbidity, mortality rates, uh, not really mortality rates, but you provided lists of patients with mortalities. What would be useful is to yes. present those mortalities instead of a case form, is to actually put it out as the kinds of cases um, that, that are presenting, especially the, um, the morbidity related like an asthmatic. So what was your impression um, from the morbidity mortality, what struck you? And that's really what's valuable in the mortality or in an m, &M morbidity mortality rates, is to sit and ask yourself, what's, what's large problems that you would say um, at large problems, but also then looking closely at preventable problems? Sure. So I think uh, in a lot of the uh, death on arrivals where the family brought the patient in. I think there, there's also a delay in patients presenting to a healthcare facility when there is a serious problem or patients seeking medical attention when there is a problem. For example, with the first case, a known asthmatic not having an emergency pack at home and uh, an asthma attack is obviously a fatal incident. And the minute she did have an asthma attack, you know, she left home and, you know, there's a delay. She, her, her intention to buy an inhaler that obviously takes a large amount of time. And had she presented to the facility earlier, perhaps she, there, something could have been done on time Not in the other patients as well. Okay. I mean, like someone reported to have stopped breathing two hours before, um, uh, we, we can only assume because the patient was brought, brought in by emergency medical services that there was perhaps a delay. Uh, when I was on call the other day as well, we had a, a little baby who was a, a death on arrival and the family said the baby was quite sick at home, had stopped crying and they had called the emergency uh, an ambulance. Um, they had waited, waited, waited for the ambulance and Eventually, they managed to uh, get some friend, a family friend, to drive into the clinic. However, by that time, it was too late for us to do anything. So really there's delay, definitely delay in time from patient for, for patient to come in, both by themselves or by the EMS. Any other challenge? I think both. Oh, I think both, both actually. Yeah. Yeah. So both because, delays uh, by the ambulance, delays by patients. And we'll come back to how you deal with them, but any other issues that you think that struck you as to the, in, in terms of the death on arrival, if you have- So any... also just with regards to, uh, as we've already mentioned, um, history taking would be a big one because at this point in some of the patients that we've discussed, we can't actually deduce what could have been a problem and what could have been preventable, um, yes. uh, whether the information was received by the emergency medical services or from the family themselves, there is not a lot of documented note with the death on arrival patients. And I, I guess with regards to whoever saw these patients in casualty, when they come in and there's nothing to do for them, the notes seem very brief. However, we do need to still see these as patients and we do need to still make sure we have extensive notes so that Absolutely. if there is any pattern or something that we can pick up and prevent, then that's dealt with accordingly. Okay, that's good. So good notes. Any others? Um, there seem to be one condition. Any others? But one condition that seemed to pop out and very noticeable was asthma. Sure, I think you yes. had about two or three cases that seem to strike strike out. Obviously, you've yes, got a whole lot of trauma that is there, 
And I think we can talk a little bit about some of those cases, but I think that that's really what's useful if you can pull out that the next time round or any of the interns presenting is what are the kinds of problems that are emerging and then see how you might address them, especially in terms of mortalities. Uh, Michelle, Dr. Taluta and Dr. Jadan. I think you've got, yeah, thanks, Dr. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, I just wanted to, um, something that always bugs me and something that Maggie kind of raised. Um, I think the whole um, surviving sepsis kind of guidelines, um, I just, it, I always wonder why we don't have any microbiological testing at PHC level because um, often we do have to give stat antibiotics um, because of surviving sepsis. Um, but we, we, but it does kind of affect the diagnostic processes. So just from a systems issue, I think that's one of the things that we really need to look at a bit more carefully. It just struck me when she said that. For sure. No, thank you for And that. then can I just ask, Pat? Yes, go ahead. Uh, one more yeah. thing. I just, as you were saying, I didn't get a good delineation of the type of medical conditions that they were seeing, and particularly in this COVID time from the list that they gave. So just a little bit more, I don't know if they can pull that information out, as you say, a little <coughs> bit better in terms of the types. Well, um, yeah, I think Dr. K Dr. Amanda may have guided them to look at only the casualty statistics, which is what they've done for the 24 hours. And I think- But that's where months. the medical stuff presents as well. So it just- Well, yeah. clearly from what medical they've emergency. got here, it seems like it's not in casualty or their casualty stats oh. do not reflect the sort of outpatient cases. So I think that might be a little bit of a local challenge. You might have a look at it with, with Dr. Petkova, but I'm mean, with Dr. Manda, but you can see that general assault is, you know, these are all looking like casualties, strictly casualty cases. Yeah. Um, so I think that could oh, be okay. a different exercise, looking at the entire uh, facilities, head count and stats in those regards, or looking at, the OPD in the casualty, the sort of non-emergency in the casualty, um, those are different takes on it. But I think there's lessons nonetheless in this um, you know, key thing. And I think we should ask, what are we learning? What do we do about it? And I think that's really a key um, question uh, going forward. So leave, leave that slide, um, Sanisha. That's actually quite valuable to see, well, what are the big issues and what are we doing about it? Um, so go ahead, uh, Mimi, you had a question as well. Mimi, Dr. Jadan. All right. I just wanted to know, are um, COVID tests done on DOA patients, those that come in for nonviolent reasons or not poisonous? So um, are they routinely done, never done, sometimes done? Was there a directive that said they should be done? I think there's a directive that says it should be done in for in um, if they're non-natural deaths. So in other words, if they're going for a post-mortem. But I think that is a key problem is that in some one of these patients, it crossed my mind was there not a glucometer done, even though the patient's dead, it might have told you what you know what the blood sugar was. But I think that question should be asked is how do you deal with DOAs? I'm surprised. Um, you know, most C CHCs, I'm not sure the the degree of deaths coming in, but this is huge in uh, Alex. They definitely need to have a protocol for how they man manage DOAs, not only the record keeping, but precisely what investigations are done um, as, a, as a way to understand why those deaths have been. Not all are going to be declared non-natural, and so there won't be any data. So that's a key question for Dr. Manda um, to ask in the, at the local level is what sort of protocols to manage that. But I think Dr. Manda is not uh, on the call or unable to speak. Dr. Manda, you're free to respond, but I don't know if anyone else can say it. I don't think that's done on any DOA. And if it was done, well, I would I can only speak. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, just, yeah, just for, as an intern, our experience of working there and how um, this sort of thing, the whole screening process is carried out. We have, you know, as uh, any facility, we have tents outside, which we've denoted as the chest clinic where patients are screened. And um, basically, I think the, the sticking to what's on a form 
is very rigid. So it basically does the patient have coughing, yeah, <laughs> shortness no. of breath, this, this, sure. and this. But this and would a be a, a live patient this, walking in. That would be a patient, yeah. not a death. And that's the key Yeah, question. no, I completely understand. So what I'm saying is when it's like an emergency like this, especially mm. the DOAs, the guard sort of just direct them straight into casualty. Of course. So they, you know, they get diverted from the gate already. Yeah. Straight to casualty rather than, uh, you know, the tent. And once you're in casualty, no one in casualty will, would do a swab. Um, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of like, okay, those resources aren't, I guess, which they are, they are definitely important in this case, but I think no one thinks, okay, why should I do a swab now? What's the importance? It's not going to change the management. A lot of the time I hear that from, with any investigation, they say, okay, we don't need to do this and waste resources because it's not going to change the management. Well, I think that's the wrong approach because clearly these, this information can influence the management of patients if we, if we understand the issues better. So I, th I think the point is that the, the, you know, it, it's quite easy for people to dismiss it, but we need to say, no, no, it is not to be dismissed, that we need to think about a DOA. Now that might be not only DOA, it might be all deaths. Even if the death happens during the admission, it's not DOA only. Any death, even a DOA, needs to be looked at and investigated in a more robust manner and not just uh, assume that forensics will do that. Uh, Dr. Jordan, we'll come back to the question and I want the, you know, Kanisha, you can have a thought about it, but what does it mean that you've got this inordinately high general assault that has occurred in the, you know, in the area um, and then burns as the second most uh, important ele element and then accidents on the street. What do you do? How do we manage it? What do, we, do you think we can do in the com Alex Community Health Center to address some of these and think population health? Um, let me go to Dr. I think I saw Ms. Uh, Dr. Jordan, you had your hand up, I'm not sure. Uh, Dr. Kalula, you want to speak? No, no longer, Prof. Thank right. you. Okay. So, Sanesha, and I think, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to speak. Yeah. Sanesha, do you want to um, respond to that? What do you think, I mean, of that? So, and Joshua, you may chime in as well, um, and anybody else. So, so I from think my point of view, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Joshua. So I think with the uh, sorry, Sanesha, go ahead, and then Joshua. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. So I go think ahead, with the population that we're looking at at Alex, mm. um, uh, with regards to the incidents per category, the Alexandra population is, tends to be a more violent, you know, True. sort of population profile. So that would indicate a higher rate of general assaults. Mm. Um, and uh, for example, with regards to the area surrounding um, people, you know, are, are either in like low income or like um, uh, uh, um, more informal settlements that could also uh, uh, be attributed to the burns. And I think a lot of the patients come in, they're from poor backgrounds. It's always like a stove was uh, being used on the floor or there was a fire in one of the... Um, the, the uh, informal settlements next door to this person and this then spread. So that could be attributed a lot to the burns. And as I said, um, the community, I think uh, there, there is a lot of, uh, you know, acts of violence within the community. There's a high rate of alcohol use. There's a high rate of poverty. And this can explain the assaults. This category that the statistics that we have is general assaults. So that's made up of beatings and, you know, like a, a, a blunt force trauma as well as a, a penetrating that's not a stab wound. So, you know, it's a very large category we're looking at. If we had to break it down, however, we don't have the stats for the actual breakdown, but we would perhaps know a little bit more as, as to um, why is this uh, rate of incidence higher in this community? 
but I think it's explained by firstly the area Alexandra itself is one of the poorest communities uh, this rate of poverty um, of uh, you know alcohol use and I think the just to be blunt the the things that occur in poverty struck in communities do sort of increase the rate of violence and general assaults. Um, this is also gender-based violence could be part of that category. Um, assaults as a result of intoxication could be part of that community. Robberies, which could also be uh, related to the rate of poverty could also be part sure. of that. Let, let me stop you there, Sanesha. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, I think the point is that you've got to ask yourself, I mean, what, what, what we don't want is necessarily just an explanation. An explanation is useful because you need to understand it, but you really want to ask yourself, firstly, how, what is preventable? And that's what you need to think about. And preventable means that what do I do about it? How can I do something about it? And something is not necessarily, you know, fixing up, but preventing so you look got to ask yourself, what can I understand about preventable, uh, um, you know, conditions in terms of general assault? You've mentioned the fact that it is, um, you know, could be gender based violence that's increased considerably uh, with COVID and the lockdown. Um, so understanding that would be useful. You looked at you've talked about other con you know, issues like alcohol related to poverty or other conditions that relate to poverty. Um, that is something you need to say, well, what of them can I do something about? But something that you can ask yourself, well, can I do something about? Now, that not, that's not about you as the doctor, but that you look around in the community, in the team, in the Alex Health Center and say, who can be able to reach out into the community? Can this not become a part of a priority exercise with uh, considering a community diagnosis? You've got data that says things to about what is going on in this community that you need to address with the community health workers, the community itself, and how much you engage with them. So these are important questions. I mean, MVAs, PVAs, how might you help to change that equation? So Joshua, you had some comments and I don't know if any other one wants to stand up. If you just uh, pick up your hand and, and do it. So Joshua, you were going to comment. Uh, so just very much what Sanasha did. What, Go ahead. I 100% agree with what Sanasha said. And uh, some of the problems are, are infrastructure based, like the roads and the robots and the, the stoves. But for me, it actually just, it makes me quite sad when you work there and, you know, uh, the majority of your cases are, are just violent cases. It just, just it actually makes you very sad when you're working there and case after case is, is trauma and violence that you think, could this be avoidable? Is there any way we could actually decrease these numbers of, of um, but that's the of, question, of general Joshua, assault? Joshua, the question yeah. is, it is sad. And I think the big challenge is for us as clinicians is not to see ourselves being, um, being sort of stunned by the light. We're actually stepping up to doing something about it. So I think the key question is, what can be done about it? And you need to explore these issues, but things can be done by the clinicians with the rest of the team in the facility. And you ought to be asking yourself that question instead of being overwhelmed and saying, well, I'm just going to do that. So thinking about, think about it. And I think we have to close in the next minute. It's nine o'clock already. Dr. Kalula, you have something you'd like to say? No, thanks, Prof. Nothing more. No problem. I think oh, anyone who unmutes themselves, I think, wants to say something. All right. Well, um, I think that's some work for you guys to do. And uh, certainly, uh, this is a, a very useful presentation. It's really great to see that you and, you know, Sanesha and Joshua pulled up this kind of information. I think it's really insightful. It can work in many places to identify what are the big issues. Um, just simply putting out everything and being overwhelmed by it is not really much of value. Taking one at a time and looking at them is useful, but it should be based on you trying to take a case, the one that is really uh, represents the big problem, using that kind of case to sort of make it grounded in real care. Um, so, you know, looking at that general uh, assault, a patient in that space and presenting it and exploring what might you do about such a large problem that exists 
um, is the way in which we make differences um, and not just hone our clinical skills. I think that that emphasis needs to change in M&Ms. It really isn't about us being better doctors uh, clinically only. It's about us being good family doctors who look after the community and actually change the equation across the, the entire landscape. So um, with that, I want to say thank you all very much. It's been very helpful. Uh, thanks once again to the two interns. Uh, really appreciate your effort and to all those in the team that have put this together. We really appreciate your effort. It's uh, 902. Thank you all very much. Uh, the link will remain the same. So if you've registered um, and if you are a uh, wanting CPD points, uh, those will be recorded and you'll be sent them shortly in about a few weeks um, once it gets to VITS. Um, so please note that you will be receiving CPD points if you are needing them. So with that, thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Be safe. Bye-bye.